Welcome to Spirit Chat Live. This is Miss Melinda, your spiritual advisor from MissMelinda.com. Live Spirit Chat is a chance for you to participate in a free live group teaching session and get your questions answered about all kinds of things, spiritual, magical, metaphysical, and so forth. Here we chat about candle magic and divination, developing our spiritual path, developing our spiritual connection, developing our spiritual practice, and all kinds of things related and in between. And every live spirit chat, I do accept early bird questions. Those are submitted on Instagram. At the top of the hour, I will begin to address those early bird questions. And from there, we will take live questions. But first, I do have a few special announcements. So today is the last day that I am offering some limited offers for readings via my website, MissMelinda'sMetaphysicalServices.com. And those are 15-minute phone readings and text readings. These are readings that are only offered on a limited basis. And today is the last day that these will be offered. So you have until the end of the day on Saturday to take advantage of those offers. Also, we are considering changing the time of Spirit Chat Live. I've taken a couple of polls, one on Instagram, one on the Mystic Membership site via Patreon. By the way, these live Spirit Chats are sponsored by my Mystic members on Patreon. So if you'd like to pop over there, there's a link below the video. You can check that out and see how you could further support or join the community. And I've taken a couple of polls about the time and day of live spirit chat, and it seems like we've boiled it down to the possibility of Sunday afternoons or a weekday evening. So if you have a preference about what time you would like to participate in live spirit chat, you can go ahead and comment with your preference for that. And let me know, I would like to take into consideration what will work for people and what you prefer. And then the next thing that we have coming up is a full moon on September 2nd. We will be honoring Our Lady of Guadalupe for that full moon group spiritual service also offered via Mystic Membership on Patreon. Lastly, I am in the thick of shadow work. I am preparing a shadow workshop called Shadow Land, and you can look for more information about that coming very, very soon. In the meantime, feel free to join the conversation and drop a comment below if you have any questions about shadow work, what shadow work is, or how we'll be delving into it. You can also hit me up on Instagram. I've been posting a lot of really interesting information about shadow work and you can feel free to join the conversation there as well. So let's get started with our early bird questions. I will be looking at my phone to check Instagram for those early bird submissions and start diving into them. So the first question I have is about finding a balance between the heart and mind as well as balancing emotions. So I have a couple of hacks for that from a sort of um, spiritual as well as energetic perspective. And these are things that I've actually used for myself. So I like to implement a lot of chakra work in my own personal work. Um, and for me, this is about a little bit more than meditation. This is actually energy work working with those energy centers in my body. And I find it to be a really powerful way to assist with developing intuition, but it can also be a really powerful way to not only enhance your psychic abilities, but to heal your body as well as to work with emotional energies. So um, basically you can use chakra work for a variety of intentions. Um, it is working with the energy that very directly flows through your body, and it's a very powerful way to create a shift that starts within you and then blooms out into your outward world and into your outward life. So one of the things that I like to do for working on balance between your head and your heart 
is literally to focus on the area that is between your head and your heart. So I work with my throat chakra to assist with that balance between your head and your heart. If you have a clear energetic pathway between your head and your heart, that's going to flow right here through your throat chakra. Um, working on your throat chakra with this intention can be a very powerful way to assist with communicating between your psychological self and your emotional self as well as uh, directing that energy between those energy centers. So there's a few different ways you can think about this. And one way is that if you have some kind of um, imbalance between your mind and your heart, then it could actually be uh, an energetic imbalance at its root. So by working with that energy very directly, you may be going right to the root cause. Even if it's not the root cause, maybe overthinking is your root cause, right? That's a very common thing. So even if it's not your root cause, um, working with the energy is still a really powerful way to create a shift. And these chakra meditations or this energy work, it's very, very simple, but can be really powerful and create um, a dramatic change within you rather quickly. So in order to work on opening up your throat chakra, you can very, very simply imagine bright blue light flowing right through that energy center. Um, if you want to take this a step further, I do actually recommend a cleansing of the chakra first. So in order to do that, I would focus on sparkling golden light or perhaps white light flowing through that chakra. Because with this work, we are specifically addressing the balance between the head and the heart, then you may want to actually envision it flowing between those two energy centers. When you envision this energy, you want to take that a step further. You want to also conjure up the feeling of the energy. So some hints for that are um, imagining that it feels warm, imagining that it feels tingling, imagining that it feels energizing, and really um, conjuring up that feeling physically, as well as emotionally, as well as in your imagination. So if you can imagine the feeling, you will in fact conjure up the actual feeling and feel it. Um, an interesting discussion that I was having with one of my one-on-one -on -one clients who's working on psychic development uh, very recently was the distinction between imagining a feeling and actually feeling it. And my point is, if you can imagine it, that is a gateway to actually creating it and feeling it. She was afraid that if she was imagining the feeling, then maybe she wasn't really feeling it, that she, she felt like perhaps she's just imagining that she's feeling it. But it, there, is, there is a point where that line becomes blurred and there is no difference. If you cause yourself to feel it, you are indeed feeling it. And that is one way of manifesting. So when you are imagining the feeling of this energy flowing through your heart chakra, there will come a point where that becomes a tangible feeling for you, where you are actually causing yourself to have this feeling. And when you do that at that point, you are in fact manifesting a change within yourself, manifesting a change within your throat chakra. So I highly recommend that you can work on the throat chakra individually as an isolated area and then also take it a step further and begin to really focus on that channel between the two and of course you can personalize this energy work you can personalize this visualization you can imagine your heart and your mind communicating back and forth you can imagine that channel flowing through you as being a powerful information channel that um, assists you with that communication that is so much needed, that assists you with that balance and so forth. The other part of the question had to do with emotional balance. So working on balance in the way that I have been speaking about will assist you with emotional balance, but there are a couple of other things to take into consideration as well. Um, 
there are several things in fact. So one thing is that we're never going to be totally emotionally balanced. We're not supposed to, and that's okay. So make sure that at, at the forefront of, of your approach is acceptance, acknowledgement and acceptance. Make sure that you understand and you accept yourself the way that you are and that you understand you're supposed to have emotions that are sometimes powerful, that are sometimes intense, that are sometimes um, louder than other feelings. It's totally normal and healthy to have emotional responses, especially when things are upsetting. You know, it's normal to have anger. It's normal to have sadness. It's normal to be overwhelmed about the things that are going on in the world. And it's totally okay and healthy for us to have those reactions when we are working on our spiritual development and our emotional awareness it's all about how we deal with those feelings it's never about trying to make our feelings go away we're not into toxic positivity here right we're not living under the misguided idea that we're never supposed to feel negatively we are definitely supposed to have the wide range of emotions that we are able to have you you can't have real joy, real happiness, real contentment if you don't also, on the other hand, have anger and sadness and pain. We, we are supposed to have a full range of emotions. So accept that and accept that it's normal and healthy to have that. Now, however, I do understand that there are times when we do feel just um, emotionally unbalanced or as if our emotions are yo-yoing up and down. In that case, there could be a few things going on. You may need to do a spiritual cleansing. You may benefit from some grounding work. I have a really great cord clearing meditation on YouTube free on YouTube. Check it out. I also have a grounding meditation there. These are two really uh, great approaches to kind of centering ourselves and grounding ourselves in some earth energy, bringing ourselves back into a center focus, back into a balanced perspective. So there may be some approaches like that that can be helpful for you, but if you find that this is so that's more in the situation where this is sort of a um, short term thing that you're dealing with, like a flare up, or maybe you've just recently become really stressed or really overwhelmed. And um, as a result, you're experiencing these emotional ups and downs, right? So those meditations can kind of be like a quick fix to bring you back to center in the moment. But if you find that you're experiencing this kind of um, imbalance on a regular basis, like this is an ongoing problem for you, then you may want to do some long-term ongoing work in order to transform over time. So that's something we need to take into consideration with spiritual work, spiritual growth, spiritual transformation, is that the the bigger the challenge is, the longer that it's been around for us, or the more systemic it is, the more it has um, kind of, th the more it affects different areas of our lives, right? Like if it's a problem that affects many different areas of our lives or that it seems to seep into our life on a regular basis, um, then the bigger the work is that we need to put in in order to remedy it or in order to change it or in order to transform it. So when it's an, a long-term ongoing problem or when it's something that's like stemming from a deeper root and kind of coming out in all kinds of different symptoms or all kinds of different situations, then we need to create for ourselves a long-term plan. And that can be as simple as dedicating yourself to a certain type of meditation or a certain type of energy work that you're going to do, you know, for a certain period of time over an extended period. Just upfront having that acknowledgement and acceptance that a bigger issue is going to take bigger work and understanding that we're not made to change overnight. Some situations do, but we can't expect that. We're not made to change overnight. So when we need to make bigger changes from the inside out, it needs to be something that we commit to for a long period of time. So 
getting to an exercise. There's something that I have used that is just for um, overall balance. In fact, I used this, this meditative exercise for a balance between my left and right brain, but you can use this exercise for balance in general. And what it is is a really simple visualization where it's important that first you are in a meditative state, right? So you do some kind of preparation first. You're already in a meditative state and then you go into this exercise. Um, and in this exercise, you visualize your mind and you visualize you do that by visualizing the inside of your head. So more so than your mind, you're really visualizing the inside of your head. Visualizing your skull kind of as an empty cavity with the idea that your mind is there, that the two halves of your brain are there. You, you, you visualize it as um, two separate cavities. So you may want to envision a wall separating the two hemispheres of your skull. And you visualize then a mirror in the bottom of your skull on one side. And on the other side, you visualize water or pure sparkling light or golden light, whatever works for you flowing down into that side of your head. Actually, I did that wrong. It's going to be flowing down into the side of your head that has the mirror, bouncing off of the mirror and then flowing to the other side. So it's an exercise in balance where you're really um, practicing sending energy between the two sides of your brain and where you're really, um, it, you're kind of abstractly taking in the concept of balance within yourself and taking in the concept that you need to communicate between both aspects of yourself, both halves of yourself or both halves of your mind or between your heart and your mind. So a lot of these kinds of visualizations or energy work are done for psychic development and sometimes they're a bit more abstract and they're meant to really be communicating to our subconscious mind and communicating to our energetic body, communicating to our emotional selves, you know, really communicating on those subtle layers within us, a larger concept. So obviously the larger concept here is balance. And while you may not be specifically focused on your mind and your heart or your, your head and your emotions during this exercise, you are communicating to yourself on a deep level that you can have balance and you are actually practicing the feeling of balance and you're practicing the act of balancing energy within you. And through those visualizations and through those uh, feelings, you're communicating to yourself that you understand balance and that you're capable of creating it, that you know what balance is, that you embrace it and that you want it. So that's at the crux of that kind of, of an exercise. And there's a lot of exercises like that for different types or different nuances of spiritual and psychic development, some of which have been practiced, you know, for a long time, some of which were practiced by ancient Buddhists um, and, and so forth. So this is, this is not something new. This is not something necessarily new agey, although it has been um, embraced by new age communities, right? This is, these techniques are ancient. And the important thing to keep in mind is that even if you don't feel that it's a very direct message, the way that it works is that you are communicating to yourself on a deep level that you embrace these concepts that you know what they feel like and that you have the ability to create this kind of state within yourself right when you communicate that to your brain that you have the ability to create this kind of state within yourself you will then be more able more easily more easily able to create that state at will 
what you're actually doing, one thing that you're actually doing, or on one level, what you're doing is creating new neural pathways so that your brain is, is becoming more practiced at creating these states for yourself um, through the use of your willpower, right? So that's that's kind of the root of what we're doing here. So eventually your subconscious mind will get the message and your brain will get the message that, hey, we can do this. We can create this kind of state for ourselves. And these things become easier and easier to the point where eventually you can create a balanced state for yourself within a moment's time. That's the, that's the end goal. So those are two things that I recommend. And then, you know, lastly, what I recommend is like the same thing I recommend for anything. And that is meditation. Just consistent meditation uh, is going to help with all kinds of balance, including emotional balance. And, and like I said, it's not going to be that you're going to stop feeling negative or you're going to stop like having anger or getting sadness or getting anxiety or whatever the case may be, you're still going to be a, a normal human who has to deal with challenges and who has surprises and difficulties and hopefully has a healthy, wide emotional range of, of reacting to life. But what's going to happen is that you're going to feel more centered. You're going to feel more balanced. You're going to feel calm. You're going to have a, um, clearer mind so that when these things arise and when these emotions arise, you're going to react differently, right? So you can react in a way that is perhaps more even keeled, that is more balanced, that brings more clarity, or that brings more thoughtful, thoughtful action in terms of how you're going to process those feelings or what you need to do about those feelings or how you're going to express those feelings. So it's never about like making the experiences go away or making the feelings go away. It's always about how we react to those things and how we deal with those things and making that part of it easier for ourselves. Okay, I've got another question here about curses. I think maybe I have a few questions about curses. Does a curse placed on family stay there forever? So the first thing that I'll say is that um, in my worldview and in my belief, a curse of this nature is very rare. I think that we have a tendency, if we believe in magic, we have a tendency to then also believe really strongly in curses or negative magic. And I think that that is a, I think that that is a dangerous path to go down because you don't want to go around your life believing that everybody and anybody has the power to harm you with negative or unwanted magic. Um, a lot of people go kind of crazy, you know, you, you can go crazy if you allow your mind to wander down that path too much. Um, you don't want to become paranoid. You don't want to walk around feeling as if you have to protect yourself all the time. You don't want to assume or think that every time something goes wrong in your life, that it's because of a curse or because of some kind of witchcraft or because of some kind of negative or unwanted, unwanted magic, right? So that's just kind of a precursor. Also, somebody who has the ability to place this kind of curse is very rare. And most people who claim to be placing these kinds of curses are lying. They're, they're fraudulent, right? So, uh, you know, it's kind of like, um, I mean, most people who utter a lot of threats aren't actually going to back them up, right? Um, so just keep that in mind. There's not really a lot of people out there who are able to place this kind of curse or willing to or want to. Someone who has this, this level of um, ability in magic and this level of understanding of magic is most likely not going to place a curse um, just willy-nilly, right? So there's a lot of things to understand within this. Um, now, there's a lot of different kinds of curses, that being said. There's a lot of different kinds of curses. There's a lot of different kinds of hexes. Um, and yeah, I mean, someone can 
intend to place a curse that's going to stay within a family forever, but it doesn't mean it's going to. Um, this is a really broad topic and it's a really challenging topic because the word curse is used in so many different ways. And that's something that we need to acknowledge. So when you see all of these posts and all of these memes that talk about generational curses, what they're really talking about are the negative habits or the um, learned behaviors that are passed down from generation to generation and how that becomes a curse that lives with us. Sometimes that is the healing that is needed within our family. Sometimes it's the pain and trauma that our ancestors have been through. Sometimes it's the negativity that's been passed down to us. Sometimes it's abuse. Sometimes it's um, patterns with money and abundance that have been passed down to us. Sometimes it's love issues that have been passed down to us. And we view this as a curse, but we need to make a distinguishing um, differentiation between uh, what is a curse that is caused through magic or what is a curse that is caused through this kind of intention, metaphysical intention, as opposed to what is a curse that has been passed down to us either through our DNA or through our learned behavior. So those are not the same thing. So when all of when everyone is talking about generational curses and breaking generational patterns, they're really talking about things that are passed down to us in our blood, as well as things that have been passed down to us um, behaviorally, you know, things that we've learned from generation to generation and breaking free from those patterns. And yeah, when you look at your family and you say, we've always had terrible luck with money or, um, you know, we've always had terrible luck with love or whatever the case may be, or we've all gotten into abusive relationships, forbid, um, whatever the case may be, it's easy to say we're cursed. But when you really analyze the situation, it's in a situation like that, it's more likely that this it has been passed down. So another nuance with this is to consider that a curse can be something that is a mental block for you, right? So if you believe that your family always has terrible luck with love and that because of that, you won't ever find the love of your life, if your grandma told you that or your aunt told you your family is cursed and that's why you all have these troubles and you look around at your family patterns and you say, yeah, we do all have that problem, you can actually be setting up a mental block for yourself. And is that mental block a type of curse? Absolutely. That is absolutely a type of curse. But again, that is not a curse that has been caused magically. So what I find more often than not is that a generational curse or a family curse is something that has not been caused by magic. Now, there are... Um, there are a lot of different kinds of curses and there's a lot of history surrounding this and there are some famous cases of historical witches and historical figures um, who have cursed and have been cursed and these curses um, remaining generation after generation and I can't I'm not going to go into all of it here, but I did a whole series on YouTube about curses and energetic blockages. And I go into some historic case studies and I break all of this down. So um, at, its, at its crux, a curse is really some type of energetic blockage, but the way that it's caused can vary widely. So go ahead and check out that YouTube story or the YouTube series uh, about curses and energetic blockages, and you'll get um, some more in-depth information to break all of this down for you. The short answer is it's possible, but very, very rare, okay? And, it, and even if someone was powerful enough to place a curse on your family and to have enough willpower and enough metaphysical um, know-how and enough energy to really place a curse on your entire family and to have the intent that that curse would last forever, it still doesn't mean that it can't be broken, okay? So that's another thing to consider.
Okay, and then she says, I'm still learning, but some rituals that I do for myself feel right while others might not. Yeah, for sure. So that's totally normal. Um, that is why in my teachings, I emphasize so much that it's really important to find what works for you. Um, if you're repeating a, a ritual from a book or you're repeating instructions as if you're reading a recipe out of a cookbook and you're just going through the process like okay put the feather on the left and put the oil on the candle and then read these words you know you you're not necessarily going to be practicing something that resonates with you um, that's why so many of us magical practitioners emphasize learning the structure of of magic learning the learning the roots of what really makes magic tick and then being able to create that magic for yourself being able to hand tailor the process in a way that works for you and in a way that really resonates with you energetically emotionally mentally your magic isn't going to work if it isn't something that resonates with you if it isn't something that feels right to you. So that is really one of the most important things rather than, you know, finding out what they did a hundred years ago and following those steps, that may be a really powerful ritual, but if it doesn't feel right to you, then it's not the right thing for you. So it's really important in magic, in any kind of ritual and in magic to find what works for you, what resonates with you and what your, you know, what your energy really like sings with what it um what it clicks with and you know when that click happens like you you feel that shift that energetic shift very palpably when you connect strongly with magic and when that shift occurs where you're really in the flow of that energy and and it is working you can feel it very strongly so if you're someone just starting out and you haven't felt that and you're wondering is this working it's not working yet. And it's okay to start by, you know, following those book instructions, following those recipes. That's, that's fine. That's a great way to start. But just keep in mind that your goal is that you're going to get into that zone where you feel that click, where you feel that shift. And it's okay to spend some time experimenting until you get there, until you figure out what works for you. In fact, you have to. You have to spend some time experimenting. Okay. The more I come into my powers, the more I isolate myself because I don't have much in common with others that are not like me. It's lonely sometimes. Any advice? Yeah, so again, that's totally normal too. The more that you spiritually develop, the more that you, you know, from, from any of these perspectives, whether you're working on your psychic development, whether you're working on your spiritual connection, whether you're working on your magical or metaphysical development, it's all going to tie into your personal growth and your self growth in one way or another. That's one of the things that I love about these paths and this kind of work is that you have to grow as a person if you want to, you know, for example, learn how to cast a powerful spell. So a lot of people get into this thinking, um, I'm going to have power and I'm going to control the world outside of me or I'm going to control others. And then they get, they get deeper into it and they're like, wait, I need to grow. I need to change if I want this to work, you know, and they're kind of, um, you're kind of bamboozled into self growth sometimes. So um, I love that. I love that it can take you from the wrong reasons into the right reasons. And I love that it's a path that requires you to grow and develop as a person. So anyway, my point is, all of this is going to require that you grow. And when you grow, you change. And it isn't so much really that you change as it is that you start to drop some of the things that you don't need anymore and you get down to the things that are most beneficial and most important and um, most authentic 
and most positive and most powerful about yourself. And this is what we can refer to as our higher selves as well, right? Our core self or our higher self. So basically what's happening is you're dropping the layers that are holding you back. You're dropping your blockages, your mental blockages, your emotional blockages. You're dropping your obstacles, your negative mindset, for example. You're dropping away from these things and you're allowing these things to fall away from yourself and you're peeling yourself away like an onion and you're getting down to your core self, your higher self, which is more, which has less ego, is more pure in the sense of being a um, more truthful, honest expression of yourself. Um, you're getting down to your innocence. You're getting down to your, um, your uh, childlike wonder. You're getting down to your honesty. You're getting down to your creativity and you're getting down to the things that you really want and that you really um, resonate with and that you really, um, need in life. So you're aligning more closely with the things in life that really resonate with you at your core. You know, um, you're becoming more authentic. You're becoming less guarded, less layered. You're dropping your pretenses. You're dropping your guard. You're becoming more of who you really are and dropping away a lot of those ego barriers that you've created to protect yourself from the world or to fit in in the world or to please so-and-so, you know? So when this happens, people are gonna fall away from you as well. Either you're going to want to fall away from them because you're gonna recognize this relationship isn't doing anything for me. This relationship is something um, that served an outdated mode of being for me. This relationship is something that was in alignment with uh, an aspect of my personality that was false. This relationship is something that helped me to serve these false ego layers. This relationship was something that assisted me in maintaining destructive patterns in my life. This relationship was something that was negative, that wasn't in alignment with who I truly am and who I truly want and where I'm truly headed in my life at this point, right? So it's totally normal to drop away from relationships that aren't serving you anymore when you start to drop the layers within yourself that aren't serving you anymore. Conversely, a lot of people will drop away from you because you will stop um, serving their negative bullshit, right? So <clears throat> you can see this in, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see this in relationships that are codependent, for example, or, you know, a lot of people talk about narcissists and um, empaths these days. So people who are very sensitive as, as opposed to people who are extremely egocentric, you know, um, these kinds of relationship patterns will start to reveal themselves when you start to see yourself for who you really are. You start to see other people for who they really are and you start to notice these patterns in relationships like when people are just, they're taking too much from you or they're in the relationship because it's beneficial, solely beneficial for them but it isn't serving you, you know, um, things of this nature when you're just there to feed someone else's ego or when they're using you, so on and so forth, these things become recognizable. So as you begin to set up boundaries that are healthy for yourself and you refuse to allow others to take from you or, you know, to um, bring negativity into your life or to place you in emotional or mental harm, or you know, to um, use you in some way, then people start to back away from you because they, they haven't changed. They're still in those negative patterns. And if they're no longer able to get what they want from you, then unfortunately the relationship isn't worth it for them anymore. So really you're not losing anything. You're not losing anything. You're not losing, um, a relationship that was good for you, 
you are, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit distracted because somebody is just entering our live session right now. I just wanna make sure that they are muted. So when that happens, when people are actually taking the initiative to move away from you or to fall away from you when you're going through spiritual growth or self growth, then you automatically know that relationship wasn't good for you and you you're not losing anything that was important. Right. And the same thing when you just don't feel that you have anything in common with people, it's because um, you no longer want to waste your time. Like a lot of people who get really into spiritual development express this, or a lot of people who are just naturally inclined to um, be, be in alignment with spiritual development or to be in alignment with um, like the metaphysical world. We're also, we just like don't have tolerance for stuff that wastes our time. So, that can be a little bit problematic in the larger world, right? Like being really impatient with small, small talk, like you don't want to sit around and waste your time talking about the weather. You're not going to go to dinner with people who are going to spend the whole time talking about some TV show that you could care less about. Um, these kinds of situations are totally normal. And when people are going through this kind of development and <laughs> The advice I have is that just because you are starting to feel a void and just because you're starting to like take yourself away from those situations that are no longer serving you doesn't mean that you can't also at the same time manifest situations and people that will serve you. So as you're going through this spiritual development, as you're learning this magic, as your rituals are getting stronger, as you're growing as a human, you can use some of this energy to consciously draw into your life the people who are going to resonate with you, who are going to help you, who are going to be on a similar growth path, who are going to be inspiring to you, who are going to have these things in common with you. Now, as we all know, manifestation isn't always all about just what we do when we're alone or what we do in our minds or what we do in our rituals. You have to also back it up with action. So from a practical perspective, I do also recommend that you start going to new places. You start doing different kinds of things or engaging with different kinds of people. You start, you have to, um, it's just like, anytime you're trying to change a habit, it's never enough. It never works to just cut the old thing out. You have to bring in something to replace it. You have to bring in some positive things to fill that gap. Otherwise, you're just left with emptiness and then you go back to the habit, right? So take that approach here too. Um, you, if you're not spending time with the same people anymore, then you're probably lacking in activities or lacking in socialization. So you want to actively try new things, try different types of socializing, try um, joining different kinds of online groups, you know, seek out um, people who are doing stuff that you're interested in, um, especially people who are learning and growing like you. I find that I have found in the past being around other people who are developing psychically or spiritually can be a great catalyst for the whole group. People tend to develop really powerfully and really quickly when they do these things together. So look for groups, look for groups online, look for like-minded people, um, you know, actively seek out something to replace those old relationships and keep in mind that this is all normal. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, things are unfolding exactly as they should. And um, this is something that people commonly go through. Okay, we've got one last question that was submitted through early bird questions via Instagram. And then I can start taking your early bird questions if you have them. And if you haven't been here before, you can type those early bird questions in the chat. 
And you can scroll down to the bottom of your screen, or if you're on a phone, you can scroll through and you will see a chat section and you can type your questions there. You can either wait until the appropriate time to put those questions out, or you can just put them there now, and then I can address them after this last question. Right now, I'm just taking early bird questions from Instagram, and then I can take some live questions um, before we end. We have been on almost an hour already. Are there rituals, crystals, or other spiritual methods to improve mental health? Yeah, <laughs> um, I'm not super into crystals. Um, so that's not my area. That's not my forte. That's not my area of expertise. But I can tell you that a lot of people, I like amethyst a lot for soothing anxiety. Um, I love amethyst for peaceful, calming, tranquil energies. Um, a lot of people love rose quartz for self-love as well as for those calming kind of energies. So one thing about improving mental health and using magic in this way or using magical or metaphysical tools in this way to assist you with that improvement is that it may be helpful for you to hone in on what specific nuances or what specific areas of your mental health you want to address or perhaps more importantly, what is the root of the mental health situation that you want to address? Is it self-love? Is it that you need to increase your confidence? Is it, um, you know, anxiety? Is it fear? Is it a need to control? Does it stem from something deeper? Is there something that needs to be healed from the past, from childhood, from past relationships? Um, is your mental health a, a, a simple normal reaction to a difficult and challenging world that we're all living in right now? Like, is this a more of an issue of something that you need to deal with in order to cope and feel better on a day-to-day -day basis? Or is it more of an issue of something that um, relates to a deeper root cause? Or, you know, you also want to assess your basics. So I always recommend, even when we're going to use spiritual or magical techniques in order to improve any area of ourselves, including our mental health, that we look at things from a holistic perspective. And that means we look at things from all angles. So you want to look at this emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually or energetically. And the first thing that you're going to start with is your physical aspects. So check in on your basics. Are you drinking enough water? Are you getting enough sunlight? Are you getting enough exercise? Are you getting enough fresh air? Are you eating enough fruits and vegetables? Are you sleeping well at night? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you allowing yourself enough time to rest and relax? Do you have enough activities that are enjoyable in your life? Do you have enough hobbies? Do you have a creative outlet? Do you have um, supportive people in your life? Are there people in your life that are contributing to negativity or contributing to a negative negative mental state. So you do have to kind of assess like your base health and your base physical needs and make sure that those things are addressed before you move forward. And you'd be surprised it's really easy to miss some of our basic stuff, especially when we've already gotten off kilter when we're already stressed out, when we're facing challenging times and we've already been having difficulty, it's really easy to forget stuff like to drink enough water, you know, or to get enough sleep. Um, it's really easy to forget to eat well, to go for those comfort foods. It's really easy to stay inside for 12 hours and not get any fresh air that day, right? So these are actually really common things that we miss. And, um, can make a huge difference for us. So that's the first thing I recommend. And then I like really simple rituals for things like mental health or depression or emotional difficulties. I like really simple rituals because we need to take into consideration that we're already feeling poorly, that we don't have a lot of energy, right? That we're not going to want to do something super complicated. Um, 
first of all, I would be remiss if I didn't mention you should definitely do a spiritual bath, one that's intended for deep cleansing or removing energetic blockages. If you, you know, before you approach this kind of spiritual work, especially if you've been feeling really bogged down, a really simple bath that I love when energy needs to be sort of um, uplifted or when you need to be cleansed from something that has been heavy or difficult, you've been really stressed or anxious or whatever the case may be is fresh limes and lemons and sea salt. And you can just take your citrus press and press those limes and lemons right into your bath water. Use as many as you can, as many as you want, um, at least like five or six. And so I, I, I almost, I sometimes just use lime. So and actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I recommend just lime, lime and sea salt. You can use lemon if you really love the uplifting scent of it. But um, I feel that lime is a little bit more powerful in this instance. So just, you know, squeeze at least like five or six of them into your bath water and add like a cup of kosher sea salt. Um, pray over that water, you know, in whatever way makes the most sense for you. And this can be a hot bath. Most spiritual baths are done like room temperature or lukewarm. For this, I love to have a hot bath. And then just get in that bath with the intention that it's going to cleanse you, it's going to uplift you, it's going to revive you. And that this is kind of, this is a fresh start. It's the first step into your new beginning to start to adjust your energy and adjust your mental health. I definitely recommend this bath first. And even the scent of lime and citrus is very uplifting, very revitalizing. So there is an aspect to this where the aromatherapy is really having an effect on you um, mentally as well. Okay, now from there, the rituals that I would recommend for addressing mental health are very simple. Um, there was a time in my life where I was severely depressed. And at that time, I came across, and I don't remember the source now, but I came across a simple ritual to assist me with starting my day off on a better foot. And it went like this, have yourself a little altar set up with um, an object or item on that altar that represents all four elements and um, put it near your bed because if you're really depressed, you're maybe not going to want to go far. You don't have a lot of um, energy. And as soon as you wake up, even if you're going to go back to sleep in 10 minutes, no matter what time you wake up, if you wake up at six in the morning, even though you went to bed at three, as soon as you get up, you go straight to that altar and you light whatever needs to be lit. Let's say that you have incense to represent the element air and you have a candle to represent the element of fire. And then maybe you have a bowl of salt for earth and you have um, a bowl of water for water, right? So you light your incense, light your candle and go around and think the elements, think the earth, right? So I think you air, for the inspiration and the freshness and the newness that you bring to each day. I think you fire for the sunshine, for the creativity, for the light, for the cleansing, for the revitalization that you bring into each day. I think you water for the cleansing, for the clearing, for the creativity, for the intuition that you embody. I think you earth for the grounding, for the centering, for the embodiment, for the food that you bring into my life each day. Go, go around and thank each element and connect with that earth energy. Express some gratitude, put it out. And if you want to, you need to go back to bed, but just do that every day as soon as you wake up, no matter what. And that is a way to start um, transitioning you out of depression, giving you something to focus on, giving you some gratitude to focus on, as well as connecting you once again with your magic, connecting you once again with ritual, connecting you with the elements, connecting you with the earth. And again, like so many other things, very simple, very powerful, excellent way to create a shift within you. The other ritual that I would recommend for mental health is a seven knob or seven day candle. And 
for mental health or healing. Maybe you want to use the color blue. I love blue for healing and mental health. You can also use green for healing. You could use yellow if you're focusing more on revitalizing and re-energizing and bringing some clarity to your mental health, right? So depending on what nuances you want to focus on, dress it with any oil you want. Use, some, use something that's revitalizing. Use um, release and restore oil. Use, um, use the nuance, use it, an oil that represents the nuance energy that you need. So if you need more tranquil, um, peaceful energies, like if you've been feeling anxious and you wanna gear it that way, perhaps you need to be revitalized, perhaps you need clarity, perhaps you need energy, right? So this just depends on, again, what area of your mental health you're working on. The point is to just sit down with that candle every day for seven days and to do nothing much except to focus on and think about your intentions for your mental health. One way that you could do this is by listing something that you're grateful for with each knob that burns, you know, and another way that you could do this would be to write some affirmations for yourself or to spontaneously come up with some affirmations for yourself each of the seven days that you're, you know, some affirmations to focus on different aspects of your mental health. Um, I am whole, I am embodied, I am here, I am clear, I am healing, I am happy, I am worthy, right? Things of that nature. Um, Another thing that you could do is just focus simply on self-love. Just sit with that candle, with that specific knob each day and focus on sending some love to yourself. And the way that you can do that is just like we talked about earlier in the chat, by imagining what love feels like, focusing on your heart and imagining what love feels like, you can actually conjure up that feeling within you until you are feeling it. And really just, you're not, you don't need to send it out anywhere at this time. You're focusing on what it feels like to feel that love within you and just um, bringing yourself back to that reminder that you have love inside of you and that you are able to tap into it, to feel it at any time, that it's something that emerges within you, that comes from you, that doesn't come from outside of you. Even when you feel love for another person, it's not the other person that is giving you that love. The love that you feel inside of you is coming from within you. And therefore, you have the ability to create it, to conjure it up at any time and to align with that feeling, to center with that feeling and to give it to yourself. So that's probably the most powerful um, ritual that I recommend for mental health. And I don't see any live questions, so that brings us to the end of today's live spirit chat. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for submitting your questions via Instagram. I really appreciate your early bird questions. I always appreciate all of you that are here live. It's great to interact with you. We have wonderful conversations. And we are not going to be having live spirit chat next Saturday. So next Saturday is going to be the fifth, no live spirit chat on the fifth, but then on the week of the seventh, we are going to announce a new a time and day for live spirit chat. And I'm asking you all to submit your, um, your suggestions for that time and day. And it seems like most people are between, or right now we're between um, Sunday afternoons or a weekday evening. So go ahead and submit your suggestions. And then the week of September 7th, we're going to have a new time and a new day for live spirit chat. And I look forward to seeing you then.